you know when you want something a lot, like you really want it a lot and you want it so much that you believe and squeeze and drive for this thing as much as you possibly can? Scientists do this too. And in this episode, we meet a couple of people who really, really want to find something. They reckon they maybe succeeded in talking to certain animals, or rather, had the animals talk back. But did they? You be the judge. Date is May 9, 1965. I'm a cedar. Okay, first things first. I've just got to address the uh, elephant in the room. You know, I don't like it when you call me that. So I've gained a few pounds. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> because if I don't uh, get it out of the way now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come up to me and it's going to start banging its snout into my leg and uh, until I solve the problem. Trunk, trunk. He doesn't say hello. So yes, this is the story where the lady wanked off the dolphin. But you know what? <sighs> That's the bit that um, everyone focuses on. Just before you and continue, I have to ask a question. Is that the sound or was it the sound of a dolphin being beaten off? <laughs> to be honest, to you, be honest, it is not the most interesting thing in this tale. And I got to say, <laughs> there's a whole much more in this tale that is a lot more interesting. Hello. <laughs> hey. Good boy. Come on, Peter. Say good boy. English, Peter. Pronoun. Say Margaret. Margaret. No, this is Margaret. Not very good. Say hello. That's better. Welcome to the wholesome show. The podcast that tries to open up a hole in the universe of science. I'm Will Grant. I'm formerly innocent Rod Lambert until I just heard those noises. <laughs> that sounds like torture. And you've got to love no pronouns. English, Pro- Peter. English. Okay, you speak dolphin, woman. Let's hear you go. <laughs> That's a horrifying. Thank you. I'm horrified. <laughs> okay, quick note on sources yeah. for, for this story. There's a whole bunch out there. Mm. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of small contradictions and small elements of this story that don't come across super clearly. I just want to point to two works that I've drawn on. One is uh, Christopher Riley's work on this topic. There's some great mm-hmm. stuff there. But also one of John Lilly himself's autobiographies. Is John Lilly the dolphin? You will. <laughs> it's just a freaking cracking read. Just uh, amazing. Yeah. By the time he had his epiphany wandering along the beach in Massachusetts in 1949, John Cunningham Lilly had already lived one hell of a goddamn life. Mm. He'd had, as, as he wrote about later, experienced himself as both a sperm and an egg and directed the penetration of the sperm into the egg. So to clarify, may I? (laughs) Go. He was... Uh, um, intellectually present at his conception and made sure it went the way he thought it should. Yes. Cool. Yes. That's for the people at the back who weren't paying attention. Uh, He'd experienced, again, uh, he told this story later, Mm. uh, the deep squeezy redness and purpleness of the womb, the thrashing local catastrophe of his mother's birth canal opening and his head getting stuck for several hours. Well, we've all had the last bit, but the thrashing local catastrophe. He remembers it. He remembers his head getting stuck for several hours. Uh, I'm, it's the language that <laughs> the thrashing local catastrophe. It was. It was. It was. It was a tearing of the whole of the local universe. He'd also he'd also experienced soon after birth, uh, suckling the warm milk from the soft warm surface, and that made him happy. Mm-hmm. At three, he'd worked out how to turn off. His emotions, on and on. Uh huh. This is when his mother weaned him, and he decided, I, "I no longer love my mother," and so he turned it off. I have an emotion chip, and it can be clicked okay. on or off. At seven, he'd seen God directly. Um, okay. While he was sitting on his majestic throne, there was a little bit in the story. Who was on the throne? God or no? No, God. I think uh-huh. he, he went and hid in a closet and saw God sitting on his throne. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At twelve, he had. Um, What's left? <laughs> you've seen God, you've directed your own sperm into your own egg. You've experienced the thrashing catastrophe. 
now you <laughs> you're, you're 12 and you're like, what's the point? And he put a gun in his mouth and that was the end of it, right? No, he didn't. He no. didn't. At 12, at 12. Do you know, you know back in the in the 50s, they had those – uh, no, this must have been the 30s or so. Uh, right. Those exercise machines with the big, big, the big belt, and you just stand there and it wobbles you. So let me tell you, you we had one of those in our house Did for a while. Really? My parents rented one in the early 70s. Oh my god! And we were fucking fascinated as kids because I was like, I was a five year old going, "What are you doing, mum?" Mum was a, a larger lady. And they were sold as a, you get rid of fat because it'll just wobble your fat away. With no uh, work, you just, you just no, do it? You stand there, you turn on one of the two channels on television, and it goes, <laughs> so we'd put it on and laugh our asses off because it was just hilarious <laughs> and it sort of tickled in a catastrophic and violent way. But it was, um, yeah, they existed in the 70s. They were all the rage. How far did you go? Oh, I'd look at me, I'm lean. Well, jo- John Cunningham Lilly, um, he put it on when it was 12. Oh. It made his whole vi- body vibrate with pain and pleasure, incredible pleasure, until his pants got all wet. So, no, I didn't get that experience. I think we got a, we got one of the lesser models. <laughs> we got the entry level. This one didn't whack you off at the same time. But it wasn't all weird. It wasn't all weird. What's, what's weird so far? At 13, he was an avid chemistry hobbyist um, mm-hmm. and he supplemented his makeshift basement laboratory with chemicals he could get from um, his friend and the nearby pharmacist. So, uh, you know, I thought that was cool. Uh, his friends at school called him Einstein Jr. Did they? At 16. Because Einstein was a weird perv. No, no, he's not. Uh, uh, yet, okay, yet, I heard yet. He I wasn't yet a weird perv. He put, on, he put on the weird belt drive driven machine and he didn't know that was going to happen and it happened. And to be fair, he may have just piddled himself. Uh, he, just he, said he felt wet. Yeah, he, he did say pants got all wet. He felt shame. He did have incredible pleasure. So, Don't you like a good pee though? I, I do. <laughs> I do. Uh, where do we go? Yeah, 16, 16 at school. He did. He did. Uh, he made a documentary, a video documentary at school. Mm. I don't know how. Um, exposing hazing practices. So this must have been this must have been in the 30s so it must have been some sort of old film sort of thing welcome welcome we're gonna watch today. no and it, and it led to it led to policy changes in his school like his principal stood up and took notice of his documentary that's intense mm. okay he wrote an essay for his student uh, newspaper that's too much exploring the the I got to say pretty advanced question can the mind render itself sufficiently objective to study itself how do you even ask that question well you might come back to that one it might be a theme throughout this that, uh, that John Cunningham Lilly got a question when he was 16 and spent a lot of time trying to answer that question. Mm-hmm. He'd gone to uni. Uh, his dad wanted him to, go to him to go to MIT and become a banker. What? I know. Not quite what MIT is famous for. Look at that engineering anyway. school. Let's learn banking. Uh, John, John Lilly instead wanted to go to Caltech. He wanted to explore big questions. And become an there. artist. No, no. He, he did a Bachelor of Science. He, okay. he was okay. like, he was full science. He was a uh, Bachelor of Science. He did a lot of biology at the time. Yep. President of the Ski Club. He read Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Mm. He got half kicked out of, of uni because his dad was rich. Which half? Uh, the half that was paying the bills. He, he got a scholarship. He got <laughs> the a rest sco- of you can stay. He, he got a scholarship. Um, and, and the people in the um, running the halls said, oh, dude, we know your dad's rich, so mm. you can't stay here on scholarship. It would look bad. Um and right. and so there's a little bit of extortion where his dad had to had to pay some bills there. Uh, he participated Good. in a summer research project uh, where he went on a completely protein free uh, diet until he went delirious. Imagine that, no protein. Because oh, who needs no. to keep their muscles functioning? Mm. That's for losers. Um, Everyone knows if you're going to quit anything, just make sure you keep sugar, lots of sugar. It's, it's, it's in all the diet Look, I mean, it, it, was for, it was for a research project, and that was his, sure. fir- his first published paper. Uh, My research has made me delirious at times, too, but for much worse reasons. No doubt. Uh, after he finished at Caltech, he was like, okay, where am I going to go next? His dad said, okay, you've got to go to Harvard now. Mm. And he said, no, I want to go to Dartmouth. Anyway, weirdly. Call the jumpers. His dad had a car crash at, the, at roughly that time, crashed, uh, crashed his car off a bridge uh, like 100 feet in the air, survived. Landed in a coma, and the landed in, in a coma. Is that a landed, geographic landed, crashed and oh. and was and was okay, but got got in, into in, a coma. In coma. In coma. In coma. Yeah. Uh, and um, the first thing that his dad said the instant he woke up is, "You're going to Harvard." And uh, <laughs> and and uh, John Lilly fought back and said, "No, I'm going to Dartmouth." Uh, welcome back, by anyway, the way. Glad you're I just the idea of the instant that your dad Fuck wakes man. up from a coma. You start the fight again. Um, That's so. He comes from a driven family. He did. Is that very focused? Yeah. 
Uh, he went to Dartmouth and he studied medicine. He cut up heaps of cadavers, like 34 different cadavers, stretching yeah. out their intestines to see how long they were. I don't know if that had been proved or not before. but uh, he was, That they had length. But at this point, he was really starting to discover that research was the, the place for him. He, he, okay. he liked the idea of medicine and, and biophysics, but not in a therapeutic way. He wanted to – No. He absolutely wanted to do research. Well, cadavers don't fight back like patients do. No, no. Fight no. like with their opinions and well, their preferences. Well, I think he wants to – if it's, if it's uh, solving people's health problems, it's big picture. Okay. He's a big picture guy, not a small picture guy. I get it. It's just like when I work in a bar, I'd rather be making the drinks than cleaning the tables. It's the same thing. Well, I thought you were going to say like inventing the drinks. No. Or... No. You, you can see the, 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 the parallels <laughs> the are uncanny. The analogy is almost the there. The analogy yeah, yeah. is almost there. Yeah. I get it. Uh, then when he went to the uh, – the war came – World War II, and he continued to investigate on himself, uh, including exploring what happens when the body go, undergoes the process of explosive decompression. Um, great things? Uh, basically, basically, if you're in an aircraft and yeah. you're, you're at 38,000 feet, Boom. side of the plane gets ripped off in something, what's it like for the people on the inside? Unpleasant. So, yeah. You know what I feel? I feel uncomfortable. And I prefer this didn't happen. That's how I would imagine they would. I, that would have been the I notes. I think so, but I think they needed more than that. They needed some details. Have you got recordings of him screaming as he goes through I that? don't have those. I don't have those. I'm disappointed. And after the war, mm -hmm. uh, he published the first public-facing book on how to build an, an atomic bomb. Cool. Yeah. Philanthropist. He'd done, he'd done a whole bunch of things. But his original question always remained. Could, Why did I do that? <laughs> Could the mind render itself sufficiently objective to study itself? Nice. And so after the war, <laughs> working in various government and university research labs, you do. He, began, he began to apply the electronics, computer science and biophysics he learned at Caltech, Dartmouth and Pennsylvania to attempt to answer this question, but um, secretly. <laughs> Secret, of course, and uh, he wrote this in his his autobiography. The autobiography is called "The Scientist: A Metaphysical Journey," uh -huh. and um, with a what is a side serving of dolphin torture, a side serving of a lot of wild, a lot, of a, a lot, a lot of wild. But 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 one thing he does in this documentary is uh, docu in in this autobiography yeah. is he talks about his research career, both the things he did, and and I'll tell you some of the stuff that is concrete. You know, he had research projects, mm. delivered results, found out. Absolutely new things that people had never been done before. Mm -hmm. But he's all like, he's always like, yeah, but I was doing this to uh, have a secret agenda of the big question. The big question. Okay. The big question. We all do that. So he started turning first to a bunch of things using his biophysics knowledge uh, to try to understand the brain and the mind. That all was right. his big question. Uh, are they the same thing? Are they different things? Mm -hmm. Can can mm -hmm. we understand what the mind might be? Can we? I can don't we, know. Well, do I? That's all I've got. <laughs> anyway, good episode. In 1951, yep. uh, I think this is his first invention. Uh, he invented a method of portraying the electrical activity of the brain mm -hmm. on a TV. Um, so he That's found- That's on Netflix now. <laughs> he found you could, you could, you know, put electrodes into a monkey brain and then you could show that electrical activity. Okay. Um, in the process, he discovered that the more skull that was removed from an experimental animal, the longer it took the animal to recover from an operation. So the more you fuck up a body, mm -hmm. the longer it takes to repair. It wasn't known before. What? Uh, I, I don't know. He did discover it though. Yeah, but you know, there are some things more, let's say, earth shattering than well, others. Probably. The bigger the hole, the longer okay. the heel. Okay, his next discovery is bigger. Yeah. 1953, he moved to the National Institutes of Health in yeah. Maryland, uh, bringing his, his monkey brain electrode machine. Yes. And discovered by sti that by sticking wires into the brains of male monkeys, he could on command and separately- I know where this is going. Make the monkey erect, yeah. ejaculate, yeah. and orgasm. I've had one of those machines for years now. <laughs> so could he do it in a different order? Uh, could he just yes, make them ejaculate straight away? Yes, I believe so. I believe so. He, he says it, and, and this is what he says. Yeah. Uh, he could separate each of those different functions. Uh, he was mainly interested in the orgasm function. Sure. Um, I'll tell you why in a second. I don't um, need to be told. Who, who isn't? Yeah, I get it. I get it. Who, who is who is there thinking, God, I, I just want to make a mess. Who gives, yeah, is, exactly. <laughs> just want to get this out of me. <laughs> just want to get it out of me. Do you want to enjoy it? But I don't care. I don't care. Just want to get rid of it. 
<laughs> okay, not, fair enough. It's not doing anything. They, he showed that um, a male monkey rigged up to this um, that was allowing an orgasm once every three minutes, so there was a, a cap on that, 24 hours a day, would press the button every three minutes. Yeah, to kill himself. For 16 hours. No, then they'd fall asleep for eight hours and then start again the next 16 day. hours. 16 hours. So S- Every three minutes for 16 hours. <laughs> I'm going to need to sit down. Just thinking about that is exhausting. This is orgasm without issuing forth. I believe so, yes. yes. Just turning just, on, just push the, the cum button, or sorry, the climax button. Yes. I can't imagine there'd be any issues of addiction. No, not at all. No, no not at all. No. Um, or any other issues as well. Because what he had found was pain and pleasure centres in the brain right. and found a way to stimulate them directly. And this actually was brand new at the time. So 1953, whilst people might have speculated on this, the idea that you could reach into a brain, Mm. a particularly wired up brain, and press a button, and at that point they have the orgasm, hadn't been seen before. Isn't it great? So pornography and sex have driven so many technologies, and I like that. What are we going to do with the brain? What do you want to find out? You know, how you can switch off pain, you know, make people remember things better? No, come. Once he might have been that, finding other things as well. This no, might be a simple thing. I don't think so. I, I know this guy pretty well, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. And So as he says in his autobiography, um, this news travelled through the government. Um, Could he? Yeah, yeah. How can we weaponize it? So, oh, my Really? God. You hadn't thought that? You hadn't thought that in 1950s America? This is how, could we, how can we weaponize it? We found the pleasure button. Let's kill people with it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to have a guess how they thought how to kill people? I, my, I'm, I'm a bit boggled. So John Lilly wrote um, wrote this story. It's, it's super stilted uh, mm. in his autobiography. Mm-hmm. One day John, and at, because of his autobiography, he steps out of himself a little bit and talks in the third person. In, Proving the mind can analyze in, itself. In weird from, ways, yeah. yes. Okay. One day John was called to the telephone in his laboratory. The director of the National Institute of Mental Health was on the phone. John, I have a request for you to brief a meeting of the Combined Intelligence Services of the United States Government, Mm -hmm. the FBI, the CIA, Air Force Intelligence, Office of Naval Intelligence, Mm. NSA, Army Intelligence, State Department. They would like you to make a presentation of your brain electrode techniques for stimulating motivations within the brain. (laughs) John, Bob, this is a very dangerous area and I am very reluctant to do this briefing. What are the conditions under which it is to be done? Uh Uh-huh. I think he's just not a great writer. Nope, he's not. Uh, The director, you have to set up those conditions before you give the briefing. I know your reluctance to work under secret auspices. John, it seems to me that this very potent method of controlling human motivations, both positively and negatively, I do not want to do such briefing under security. He wanted to do it. He wanted to do it in public. He's like, okay, I'll I'll tell you about it. It's got to be public. Other people got to know. I'm gonna if I'm gonna make myself get off it a flick of a switch. I want as many people as possible to watch me. (laughs) The director. Despite the fact that you're an officer of, in the commissioned officer corps of the United States Public Health Service, this is not a conversation. No, it is not. This is a list. I will not order you to give a secret briefing. Dr. Ketty has told me that all the work in his laboratory and in yours is to be open, not under security. I agree with this. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? It's a natural conversation if ever I've read it. John Lilly. Dr. Antoine Raymond, using our techniques in Paris, has demonstrated that this method of stimulation of the brain can be applied to the human without the help of a neurosurgeon. He is doing it in his office in Paris without neurosurgical supervision. This means that anybody with the proper apparatus can carry this out on a human being covertly with no external signs that electrodes have been used on the person. I don't believe I, him. I feel that this technique <laughs> got into the hands of a secret agency. They would have total control over a human being and be able to change his beliefs extremely quickly, leaving very little evidence of what they have done. It's a freaking long leap from I can make a monkey come <laughs> to, I can make you believe in stuff that you just actively no, don't but you know, change your politics. You, you, you get the communists and you put the hat on them. Boom, um, you're a communist. And, and you, know, you either decommunize them, you put, yeah. put an orgasm every time they think of the word capitalism. And it's just, uh, it, exactly. I know the reverse orgasm. Uh. Exactly. You could do that or other way around. So he was, he was, he was quite worried about that. But particularly if they've, you've got a, a hat sitting on your head the whole time. Undetectable hat, let's not forget. Like you, you don't, And you don't need a neurosurgeon for this hat, one of the bonuses. <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, Lily did the talk. Um, mm-hmm. He did the presentation on his brain electrode stimulation to all of those spy agencies. And then- um, Did he actually live demo, like on a monkey or something? Or Don't know, don't okay. know, don't know. Uh, here's, a drawing, here's a drawing of what actually happened. Like, cool. Um, nice picture. I, I assume he showed video of it, at least. Okay. Sometime later- and it's unclear in his autobiography when, a scientist from the Sandia Corporation, 
Sandia. Sandia. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're a subsidiary of Honeywell. They're a, a corporation mm. whose basic job, uh, they've been around in the US since uh, the Second World War, yeah. whose basic job is to think about the delivery of nuclear weapons um, and and other adjacent sorts of things. When they're not, Honeywell makes safes and shit, don't they, or something uh, like that? No, Security no, no, business? No, Honeywell, Honeywell like uh, like one of the big defence co- contractors. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. I meant and make so, us safe, us safe. So Sandia Corporation, I'll tell you some more stories about them one day. Mm-hmm. They're, look, they're, they're a private entity mm-hmm. and their job is to do super secret uh, military research. As um, all super secret military research should be conducted yeah, no under doubt. conditions of the market. <laughs> indeed. Definitely. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Scientists from the Sandia Corporation found Lily and said, hey, we used your work. They showed him a video of a mule, donkey horse hybrid, mm. going across very mountainous steep slopes controlled by a sun compass and brain electrodes. Oh, the mule's course was maintained in a perfectly straight line, irrespective of terrain. The sun compass was hooked to the brain electrode, so if the mule deviated from his course, he was punished, uh-huh. and if he remained on course, he was rewarded by appropriate electrodes. Uh, the idea here, so so John was worried about people using his brain stimulation thing to mess with mess with their ideology. Related. No, no, this is this is just simple. You, the, their idea here was you mm. could put a small tactical nuclear weapon yeah. on a donkey yeah. and you you put the brain electrodes on its brain and you just march it into the enemy camp. I want to be for the opening presentation. Okay, look, we so, got a, we got a tactical nuclear device, quite a small one, and we're going to put it, are you with me, on a donkey. <laughs> and imagine all the generals going, I'm fucking out of here. Like, <laughs> this drunk clown is in here again. But who's – Son, is this? But how, how, how long would it take you to realise? You know, you, you're guarding your base, whatever, and you, you see a donkey walking slowly towards you, and you're With like- a weird hat. Yeah, at what point do you go, that's a nuke? Like, I don't think I'm going, that's a nuke. Not quickly. <laughs> no, not at all. It doesn't look right. Probably a nuclear weapon. <sighs> but the instant that John saw this, he was like, oh, fuck. I'm, I'm in this to answer the big questions. Yeah. I want to know about the brain and the mind. Yeah. I want to I wanna answer that. And my electrode work is just too readily corrupted by the government. Um, he didn't want to. He didn't want to do anything that would help out the you know like delivery once, of nuclear once weapons. Once it's out there, I, I'm going to step out on a limb and guess maybe that it's not as effective as is quite being portrayed by such folk. Potentially, because seriously, if they could, they would. And if they've done that, they don't need him to keep going. No, they don't. They don't. Well, what he's saying is is maybe if I went further down this sort of work. Uh, I'll make it easier for them. It will be more weaponizable. Yeah. Like, like you know, he saw, he saw this trajectory. An and elephant said, and four nukes. <laughs> I want to step off. I don't want to, I don't want to be on this trajectory anymore. So uh, he wanted to get back to his own secret message, mm. uh, secret mission. Mm. Um, so he abandoned the idea of harmful electrodes and he wanted to find a different way of answering his question about can the brain ever study the mind? We are going to speak English yet, Peter. So this is John Lilly's favourite invention. The dolphin? Not the dolphin. Not the dolphin. He'll get to dolphins. He'll get to dolphins. Um, <laughs> it's just such a, there's, there's none of those noises that don't sound like it's being tortured. Like, no, not one. Not it's, one. It's a tortured animal. Um, he started with the idea that... Um, Okay, how can we how can we study the mind? And he thought, well, how can we remove all stimulation from the brain? We well, poke out the eyes, deafen the ears, without hurting people. He he didn't we want to hurt people anymore. He didn't want to do any electrodes anymore. Okay, um, if we could remove the brain from like the stimulating environment, then maybe that's a pathway to understanding the mind. Okay, like you, you get rid of everything else. So um, you're going one of them tanks. One of them tanks. He was the inventor of one of them tanks. Uh, he decided, okay, I need some sort of way to get rid of all stimulation. It's got to be like go in a dark room yep. so there's no light coming in. Soundproof yep. so I'm not hearing the outside traffic or anything like that. Yep. Yeah, I want to keep the body still, neither too warm nor too cold, um, something that takes the force of gravity away from him. As he described, at this point he's calling himself the scientist in mm-hmm. his autobiography. Mm-hmm. The scientist thus visualized a tank in which the body could be supported in water that would be maintained at the proper temperature to take care of the generation of heat within the body. This tank should be in a soundproof chamber, which could be blacked out. Mm -hmm. He sketched out the necessary apparatus and began to talk to his colleagues in the National Institutes of Health, 
Um, they realized that in order to furnish air to the person, or he realized, um, you'd need to have some sort of respiratory apparatus. Yeah, you want to breathe. And happily, within the institutes, it was um, possible to do the research both on and in isolation. Hmm. There was no interference from the high levels of Minister of Control. He could just do this. Uh, Probably because they didn't care. They didn't, they didn't care. You're putting people in a bucket with a face mask on? We don't give a shit. <laughs> Go ahead. I think, and it's weird how, how little oversight anyone cared about. Do you want to deliver some results here? It's like, oh, no, yeah, I don't know. I want to see what happens. Yeah, burn it. Yeah. Um, it was weird. It was weird because one of the key, key things he noticed is that um, he could go in and use this tank whenever he wanted. And um, he ends up, he set up his isolation tank. He, he worked for a while developing breathing apparatus. He made it as isolating as possible, yeah. getting rid of all yeah. other, other sensations. And, um, and he started going in, he started using it. He's like, damn, this is the most relaxing thing I've ever been in. And then um, he was using it day and night. He'd, he'd, he'd sneak out at, uh, out of his family home at midnight or something yeah. like that and sneak in to go and use the isolation tank. He'd, yeah. be, he'd be doing it any time. Um, any time there was a stressful meeting, uh, any social uh, transaction necessities he didn't want to do, he'd say, I'm going to go and uh, do my isolation work. I'm only going to ask a vague question here. Does this at all relate to a famous movie starring William Hurt? Uh, the, 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 I, will, I will talk later about John Lilly's impact on pop culture. Okay, because um, that's that sounds in a vein. Mm-hmm. No, I, cu- I couldn't look into... you got too much to do. Yeah, too no, no, things. but yes, yes, yeah. that came up. Um, by 1954, uh, he was immersing himself in the darkness, the quiet, the wetness for many hours at a time. Have you been in a sensory deprivation tank? I have. I have too. I liked it. I, I didn't think I, I would, but I did. I thought it was quite nice, yeah. How do you go with the old ADDHDDD? I think I was only in there for a little while. I don't know. Well, it's three minutes enough. How have I done? Is it three minutes? Is it good? I feel relaxed. I'm relaxed enough. Can I go? No, I felt nice and relaxed. But uh, I think he was in there for long, long sessions. I had a. Um, uh, I was in Byron Bay and I had a, a Pommy backpacker massage me for, it was supposed to be an hour, but she decided she liked chatting with me. So she gave me like an hour and 45 minutes. Hey. And then I went into the, one of these tanks for an hour and I came out of that and like I oh. walk out, my wife's in the, in the waiting room. So like, how are you? I'm like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, I got to say one thing about John Lilly. I was going to, I was going to, um, like throughout, mm. uh, spoiler, he steps further and further away from mainstream science throughout his career. I can't imagine how this would happen. <laughs> no, no. But my God, every picture of him as he gets older and older, smiley, smiley, smiley. Oh, like, like his young pictures, he doesn't look super smiley. I mean, maybe it's yeah, just because yeah. it's the 30s or something like that. But Unhappy by, by his 50s and 60s and 70s, everyone, he is just beaming. He, e- looks, he looks like a super happy, super chill guy. So oh, well, we can move into this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In this unique environment in the isolation tank, he says, freed from the usual sources of stimulation, he discovered that his mind and his central nervous system functioned in ways to which he had not yet accustomed himself. Uh-huh. He became a bit anxious about these tank experiences. Well, he realised this is John's words, Mm. that while he was discovering interesting things for the National Institute of Mental Health, Mm. he was also finding other things, things that he didn't tell his psychiatric group that he was working with (laughs) because they would have said I was psychotic. So it was a good sign. I'm not going to tell the psychiatrist. For instance, (laughs) when he'd go into the isolation for a tank for a while, there were apparent presences which Mm. were either created in my imagination or programmed into my brain by unknown sources. Uh It's one of the two. Mm-hmm. One, That's obviously. One of the yep, two yep. Uh, that, that came in when he was in his isolation tank. He experienced the presence of persons who he knew were at a distance from the facility. He experienced strange and alien presences with whom he had no previous experience. Okay. He thought that in some ways the isolation tank was a hole in the universe. I gradually began to see through to another reality. It scared me. Like, okay. So by alien, he meant alien, not like not people I haven't met. Oh, no, no. He meant he meant quite distant, quite quite distant, further than the other side of the country. <laughs> yes, yeah. maybe even the not the, moon. not the guy outside the isolation tank, and not even people that okay. are, like he's okay. he uh, yeah he's connecting with things. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, he says he he saw nothing that could account for his experience. But key thing here, he didn't tell anyone. 
No. Um, Why would he? He didn't tell him his fears um, or what he call, called his non-consensus reality experience. He emphasized the deep relaxation and the benefits uh, derived from his experience in the tank. That's not terrible. No, it's not. Um, and he stressed at this point uh, that he did not take any LSD at this time. Yeah, I think there's a yet in there. <laughs> yep, I can smell a yet. In one of, um, one of his autobiographies, he reported on a conversation with the alien beings. Oh, God, did he write it? Uh, yes. Alien. Yes. <laughs> I am here. <laughs> no, he calls them beings, first being, second being, third being. Good. Uh, one day in 1958, John entered the tank room, put on the mask, and immersed himself in the water for the last time at the National Institutes of Health. Mm. He's moving on. Right. He had finally realised that within the government it was impossible to do the research that he wished to do. Inevitably, subtly, those in charge of research for the National Institute of Mental Health we're asking to control the isolation tank work. Is this going to happen again? Uh, those in charge of brain research in the National Institute of Neuro Neurological Diseases and Blindness were beginning to exert controls on his work. In this session in the tank, he planned to review what he'd learned over the past five years mm -hmm. and uh, see what future directions to go. He relaxed his mind and let go of the residues of the day's activities. Mm -hmm. Quite suddenly, he was in a new space, a new domain. He left his body behind. He left his human mind behind. He became a point of consciousness, of awareness, in an empty, infinite space filled with light. Slowly, two presences, two beings, began to approach him from a distance. There was a three-way exchange of direct thought, of direct meaning. Uh -huh. First being, I know, we are meeting at this particular space-time juncture in order to review the evolution of a vehicle that we control on the planet Earth. That's him. Oh, not a car. Yeah. He's at another transition point in his training. We need to review what he has done, what he's thinking, what his motivations are. We must determine what the future of his mission can be within the evolutionary speed limit allowed the hu to humans. Ah. So and, he's, a, he's a rule breaker and they'd like, well, dude. Yeah, what are you going to do? Pop, yeah, he, pop the brakes, they're here to help. And he's, he calls himself the third being here. Yeah, of course. Currently my agent, that's him back on Earth, is in a quandary. I need this conference to know in what direction he is to move next. The vehicle that he inhabits is now in a deep trance state and is willing to share with us the sources of this quandary. As you both know, he has carefully constructed a cover story in which he has invested a good deal of time, effort and training. All three of us are well acquainted with the Raja arduous steps that he has taken in his, in his human form. So he's definitely set himself up. He's one of the beings. He's driving a human body, but that body also has agency. Yes. Yes. Cool. And, he's, and he's asking them, what do I do next? He needs some mentorship. Well, no, what does it do next slash me? Well, what does it Both. do? What does what my do being we? need? Yeah. What do me and my car do? Okay. He told the beings that he'd, what he had learned, how he'd abandoned his electrode work because the military were going to take it. I mm. uh, was concentrating on isolation tank. Mm. Uh, a little bit worried people might take that as well. And thinking about other options. They replied, I would like to suggest that we arrange for his education in more profound ways. He still needs to penetrate into his own mind deeply in areas of interest uh, to us. First know thyself. When he leaves the government, I suggest that we control the coincidence in the direction of encouraging the new strand of research with dolphins. We must also control the coincidence in regard to seeking a female partner for him. He's got to get married again. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, to a dolphin? Second being. It is felt that coincidences must be regulated to help him continue the isolation tank work under better circumstances. We should also arrange for him to use LSD in the tank. Because they're reasonable higher beings. They're like, he's not tripping enough. I just like the idea that uh, you're looking for some sort of excuse and you're talking to some aliens and the aliens see, say you need to take LSD. <laughs> I just got to put, if you haven't taken LSD and you've got alien presences telling you to take LSD. You don't need LSD. <laughs> you don't. You, you kind of, you got it. <laughs> Although to be fair, my experiences, sorry, acquaintances of mine's experiences didn't see aliens. They, they saw through space and time, man. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, but yes, you don't. You don't. If you're already doing that. I, I love it though. Why, why'd you take it? They slash I? My, it was the aliens. The aliens they, told, me told me in advance. In advance. What we're really going to do is get this guy high. So since the age of 16, Lily really wanted to understand the mind. Uh, mm -hmm. his electrode work, his isolation tank work had given him insights, but there was something else lingering under his work. And that was that epiphany he had back on the beach in Massachusetts. See, he'd been trying to study the brain and his wife and he had been wandering along a beach and there was a beach pilot whale there. And he looked at it and he, he just went, let's look at its brain. Well, yes. Oh, and he's, <laughs> he, he's like, first of all, cut in. Fuck me, that is a big brain. Yeah. Now, a pilot whale is not the biggest brain, but I, I found a picture here, and they, they, are, they are gargantuan brains compared to ours. 
So sure. um, what, whales in general, we have, we have a brain that's like 1.3 litres to 1.5 litres. Uh, whales can get up to eight litres. Um, they're just, just gargantuan. And you look at them and so you So they're like seven litres smarter than us. At least. If we measure – if – we that, measure smartness by that's by, how we should by screw IQ. How many how many liters of intelligence do you have? Well, look, it, but if you're if you're looking at this and you just see that's a vast amount of brain. What is that brain doing? That and is that's literally what John said. Unambiguously, a set of balls with something growing beneath it that shouldn't be. I don't. Know. It it's, really is. It's hang a on, hang brain. On. It's does that help? <laughs> no, to me, it looks like one of those aliens, like a. Um, yeah, the big-headed alien sort of thing. Yeah, but that's because you're the, you know, you're the, you're the innocent. But this is this is the thing. Like for a lot of people back then, they really thought the thing that was unique about human brains yeah. is just that they're bigger, and they hadn't really looked at any other animals that much. You know, they, they looked at cows and dogs and things like that, and like puny brains. Yeah. And then they saw whale brains and dolphin brains, and they were just bigger, bigger, bigger. Oh, oh dolphin brains. Yeah. Well, all cetaceans. Um, right. They started with an idea that it was it was like a brain to body size sort of thing, but yep. there's that that doesn't hold that well. Like but, proportions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Graham Burnett, professor of the history of science at Princeton and um, a researcher on this topic, you're talking about a time in science when everyone's thinking about a correlation between brain size and what the brain can do. Yeah. And this period, researchers all over the place were like, "Whoa, it's a big brain." Here's that. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> Whoa. And so here's how Lily, after he'd had his conference with the aliens, described it in his book, The Mind of the Dolphin. Uh-huh. The main ideas and formulations of this book are a theory to scientifically penetrate into the area of at least one non-human mind, that of the bottlenose dolphin. Mm-hmm. So he's working on the idea that uh, this is the place where he can study the mind. He's tried studying the mind through electrodes. He'd tried studying through isolation tanks. And now he's thinking, what if I can look at a non-human mind, not a non-human brain, but looking into the dolphin to see. Look at its mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't, I'm curious to see how this goes. Or indeed, <laughs> what? <laughs> but, okay. Well, well, obviously. You Hold know, still. You, I'm you, trying to look at your mind. You know. You, you stupid you, fish. In the years that followed, John and his first wife would charter sailboats and cruise around the Caribbean looking for uh, marine mammals to observe. Their stories apparently that they Look, they, fish. Yeah, yeah, Let's yeah. That they, were, they would stick their heads in the water to try and listen to whales speaking. Oh. But in one trip in the late 1950s, the Lilies came across marine studios in Miami. That's where uh, they filmed Flipper. Oh. And it was um, one of the first places to keep bottlenose dolphins in captivity. And this opened up a chance for John. He's like, okay, maybe I can, uh, I can get some get me a collaboration here. I can get me a study. Okay. Um, he started with a small experiment with his electrodes again, mm-hmm. um, perhaps to see how he could use them. But um, you can't really sedate a dolphin because they're deliberate breathers. So instead of, um, oh. like us, we uh, automatically breathe, dolphins don't. They choose to breathe and, and they deliberately breathe. So if you sedate them, they just stop breathing and they die. That is wacky though. I know. I know. Well, we'll come back to that. Um, so things were a bit tricky on the, on the electrode, uh, sorry, on the operating table. Mm. And on one occasion in 1957, um, something happened that, that uh, changed, changed their life forever. His first wife, Mary, was still there. She wasn't wife at the time, but told, yeah. told the story much later. Yeah. I came in at the top of the operating theatre and I heard John talking and the dolphin would go, it says what, what, what here, but I'll do that. No, no, what, what, what. The moment I hear what, 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 I think dolphin. I heard John talking and the dolphin would go, like John. And then Alice, his assistant, would reply in a high tone of voice and the dolphin would imitate her voice. That's doing, Okay. I went down to where they were operating and told them what was going on, and they were quite startled. Perhaps, John reasoned, this behaviour indicated an ambition on the dolphin's part to communicate with the humans around them. Yeah, if get so- me off this fucking operating table and put me back in the water, you <laughs> monsters. That's what it <laughs> means. <laughs> do you have a desire to communicate with your captors and torturers? I do. But there is something. There is, there is something in the fact, and we'll come back to this in a second, yeah. uh, the ways that the dolphin was perhaps responding. Yeah. Um, uh, if you had a charitable mind, as some people in this story might, mm. then maybe, maybe it's, it, the door is open to hearing certain things that you want to hear. What, are you saying there are certain 
anthropomorphism and maybe a few biases come into play? <laughs> I think you are. So John knew what he needed to do. Rather than sticking his head underwater uh, and, trying to, and, and trying to learn Dolphinese, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than putting electrodes in them, mm. he needed to teach dolphins English. Well, obviously. As he described it, uh, when he left his position at the National Institutes of Mental Health, by a series of coincidences, uh -huh. I found the means to buy some land in a suitable location on the island of St. Thomas in the Caribbean Sea where I could build my new laboratory, the Communication Research Institute, or the Dolphinarium. Now, he invested. It's, it's weird because this is, this is one of the big contradictions here. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where the money for it came. Um, I've seen it had some National Science Foundation money. Yeah. Others have said NASA. Others have said military intelligence. Others have said uh, the producers of Flipper. And I the think TV show or the remake starring Paul Hogan, which was one hell of a movie. Not the remake, not the remake. Uh, but I, I just, I just, it's great that uh, the producers of Flipper are putting money as well as military intelligence, and also probably John had his own money. In well, it'd be in their interest. We got dolphins that actually talk to us. I know it'd be great. Flipper, Flipper too. Now they talk. Yeah, I mean they'd be way easier to train. Oh, wouldn't they? And we want you to go and get the bad guys. There's Russians. We need you to decode <laughs> this thing so that you can drag the nuke away. <laughs> yeah, as opposed to just that, you just have that toy that they go. <laughs> in the water and Flip would go, shit, there. Yeah, that means come here. There was a lot of stuff like that. Oh, I believe it. Look, look. Remember, I was a kid when there were two channels and Flipper was on one of them. It's, it's almost like they were basing it on something. Could be anything. That people were suspecting. Coincidence. Uh, so they started building a lab and um, you can find, you can see the plans for the lab here. Ooh. Uh, basically, it was, it was uh, a, ha a house, a building, where they wanted to bring humans and dolphins into close proximity. So they could learn from each other and teach the dolphins English. Okay. The upper floors, uh, it's got offices, data processing rooms, electronics, chemistry, histology labs. And a nice porch coming off data processing. Oh, it's got porch, yes. Uh, yeah. Front you're in, you're right. in what, Trinidad. I'm not, I'm not you, seeing the toilets there, though. I, I, yeah. That's what the balcony's for. <laughs> Probably. Um, and then the lower floors um, underneath um, has got a, a tidal pool and a pool for the dolphins to live in. Cool. They had, they had three dolphins. All of them they got from the um, Marine Studios up in Miami. There was two – Studios. So former actors. Yes, former actors. Former, former flipper extras. Former flipper <laughs> – I, I don't know what roles they played in flipper. <laughs> Having a cigarette afterwards. What was it like? Oh, it was pretty rough. I was always going for the top spot, but I was held back. I got this slight deformity on one of my fins. What I was wondering here is whether, was there one flip – in flipper, yeah. was there one flipper that was the flipper? Like, look, you know, I, especially as a kid, I was a very keen eye for telling the difference between two dolphins. And I can tell you with great confidence, it was always the same dolphin. <laughs> no question in my mind. It's like, uh, what, what is it, babe? You know. Um, how many pigs they ate in that how, how many pigs? No, they didn't eat them. But, uh, didn't but they? you know, a small pig only lasts as a small pig for a very small short time. amount of time. Yeah. And so they had to like, it was like 24 different pigs. Oh, I've, I feel um, lied to. Uh, so. Um, they had the the three dolphins, um, Sissy, Pamela, and and one and Raul, Peter, Peter, one younger younger male bottlenose dolphin, Peter. younger Pete. So they'd all come from there. And uh, who looks at a dolphin and goes, "That's a Pamela." It's not a dolphin name. A cat, I get. Budgery. What do you maybe. call a dolphin? What's your dolphin name? Keith. It's not a dolphin name. Neville. No, that's not a dolphin name either. Janine. <laughs> Splashy? There you go. That's much better. Oh, bloop, bloop. Your flipper is a good name. Yeah. yeah. Bit obvious. Yeah. Oh, great, great snowboard blue nose. <laughs> Dumb fish. <laughs> Not a fish, you son of a bitch. One of his first experiments, um, they set up a dolphin telephone. Uh huh. Can't speak English, but they can use a phone. Yeah. That's... Got, got it. So they put uh, dolphins in two separate tanks, yep. uh, which were insulated and isolated from each other. And they put uh, an underwater electric telephone, um, electronic telephone, going between them. So there was uh, a not trans- just, Not just a tube. Yeah, not just a tube. Okay. Um, a, a transmitter and a receiver. Yeah. As soon as the telephone was turned on, the dolphins exchanged sounds. And they used this to show a few things. The first one is that dolphins are polite as a species. And, and this is, I mean, this is our definition of polite. I don't, uh -huh. know if, I don't know if they're being polite to each other, but they wait to take turns in speaking. So one will speak and then the other will reply afterwards, which okay. might, might be something that might make you think, oh, it's mimicking me. 
but it can definitely you can definitely see moments where Dolphin One would say Hello. Yes. And Dolphin Two would say something different or the same, but Hello it was clearly back. it is clearly a gap. So that makes up for them being renowned gang rapists, I suppose. They're not supposed to be very pleasant to I'm their sure lady not. chums yeah, or probably. indeed anybody. Well, well But they're polite on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Redeeming features. <laughs> <laughs> Second thing they showed is, um, and you probably probably know this from what you've heard of dolphins. They've got two uh, communication emitters, both in the nose. The Front right, hole, back on it. The right hand side, yeah. does the whistles, yeah. and the left hand side does the clicks. Does it? Yes. I did not know that. No, you didn't. But I, now you do. I thought they click with their tongue like normal no. people. Uh, that's what I thought too. They no. click with half their schnoz, and they can carry out two conversations completely separately with each of them. So can I, but I don't remember either of them. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it's that analogy. He was saying it's like you're typing a conversation and talking to someone at the same time. Well, how hard can and, that be? And I'm, I'm not doing either of those very no, well, but no. maybe maybe dolphins can. I can barely do one of those well if I'm trying to do two at once. He's he's saying that maybe dolphins can click to each other in one way and can whistle to each other in another way. That's just and these could theory. be, in theory, on different topics. With yeah, different totally. Could be different topics. Colleagues. Yeah, I'm going out for fish and hey, – Did you see the latest flipper? Yeah, exactly. Total bullshit. Yeah, I was robbed. Those actors were no good. Yeah, you can't so, even cry on cue. So, but possibly. But we, but we can't figure out what that would be. No. Um, oh, they also showed a pattern of um, predictability and variation in the sound. Okay. When they turn the telephone off, each dolphin would resort to what was called, they called a signature whistle. It might not be its name or anything like that, but it, but it, would, it would have a whistle. Maybe it's looking for someone else. And they were unique and different, uh -huh. um, but consistent. And so it's sort of like they're probing of the space. And then they would turn the telephone on then they'd um, launch into a conversation. Please get me out of here. Could you got any way out? I don't you know, have any way out. I wonder how much they were saying that. No, I'm sure they seem like free spirits. They'd love to be captured. <laughs> right and uh, Lily then wanted to expand on the idea. Uh -huh. He thought, okay, they they seem to be echoing voices. Uh -huh. Maybe they could um, understand the human voice. Maybe they could even mimic it. Why wouldn't they? They can whistle and click, and that's pretty much how our languages work. <laughs> well, for that, he'd need Margaret. Margaret! <laughs> Not very good. Oh, fuck me. <laughs> Margaret Howe, love it. This is a, it's, it's, the, it's that classic Monty Python joke, you know. How do you speak to the natives? In English, of course. And what if they don't understand you? Well, we speak louder. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Go, go Margaret. <laughs> Uh, Margaret Howe Lovett, mm -hmm. like most children, had grown up with stories of talking animals. Sure. And a, lo a lot of this chunk comes from Christopher Riley's work. Uh, there was this book that my mother gave to me called Miss Kelly, she remembers. It was a story about a cat who could talk and understand humans. And it just stuck with me that maybe there is this possibility. Unlike most children, as Riley writes it, Lovett didn't leave these tales of talking animals behind as she grew up. Mm. In her early 20s, living on the Caribbean island of St. Thomas, where Lily had his lab, uh, they took on new significance. During Christmas, her brother-in-law mentioned there was a secret laboratory at the eastern end of the island where they were working with dolphins. So James Bond. Oh, oh. Just a quick aside, St. Thomas is a, uh, it's a ridiculously beautiful looking Stunning. place. Stunning. Like it just, like Caribbean and, oh, it just looks so nice. Like it looks like you're in the water any time of day. Oh, you get me to an island like that and they say, now we're going to set up a lab. I'm like, no, nah. I'm just kidding. This is awesome. Why would I, why would I do that? This well, awesome. here's the thing. Here's the thing. So uh, her brother told her this Christmas 1963 and she, a, a secret lab yeah. run by either the Flipper Studios or, or NASA <laughs> or the US military and she decides, I'm just going to go and knock on the door. Oh, Laurie. She I'm, I'm Margaret. <clears throat> uh, I was curious, Margaret recalls. Sure. I drove out there down a muddy hill. And at the bottom was a cliff, was a big white building. Lovett was met by a tall man with tussled hair, wearing an open shirt and smoking a cigarette. These are the important facts. Yeah, I know. I just, I just want the only reason I'm telling this bit is she was met by Gregory Bateson, who- uh, The anthropologist? Yes. Seriously? There you go. This is the thing. <laughs> this, this is the thing. So, so Gregory Bateson was employed as the director of the lab. So mm. Lily was sort of a uh, research, researcher at large, and Bateson was there to run it. And uh, Gregory Bateson was one of the biggest anthropologists of the 20th century. It was Margaret Mead's There's a husband. few, but yeah, he's up there. Yeah. And they're all 
like, yeah, we're wandering around being dapper, getting tans and smoking ciggies. And hanging out in dolphin labs. Fuck, what a time to be an anthropologist. I know. Oh. So, well, I, but um, it does riff off something else in this story. Yeah. People turn up in this, and it's this is this is one of the interesting things about this story. I was, I was it's like a, um, it's a bit of a river. Yeah. In the and I'm trying to isolate a bit of the river. Yeah, yeah. All around it are so <laughs> many other people that have got weird agendas, weird ideas, Fucking and Bateson. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why'd you come here? He asked Margaret. Well, I heard you had dolphins. Lovett replied, and I thought I'd come and see if there was anything I could do or any way I could help. Unused to unannounced visitors and impressed by her bravado, Bateson invited her to meet the animals and asked her to watch them for a while and write down what she saw, which I, stranger stranger turns up and say, I hear you got some dolphins. Like, okay, Come on me. in. I like the cut of your jib, young lady. Please take some notes as well. Oh, I'll, I'll see what your notes I'll are take like. take photo. That, okay. Things were simpler then. Well, look. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. Maybe Gregory Bateson was insane. If he was – actually, if they were in – where no, are they? St. Thomas. I, Gregory Bateson. No dis- pot there at all. Gregory Bateson disappears from this story now. I mean, he, he's got some interesting ideas and I, I don't, yeah. uh, nothing yeah, no, I've seen no, yeah, seems yeah. to be insane. But despite no scientific training, yeah. uh, Lovett turned out to be an intuitive observer of animal behavior and Bateson told her she could come back whenever she wanted. And a gifted language trainer by the sounds of things so far. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Bateson focused on another part of the lab where they were doing animal to animal communication. Yep. Uh, Lily focused on other things we'll come to in a second. Oh, I think he did the thing with when you watch chimps play or fight, if you don't have context, the behavior looks exactly the same. He's quite famous for doing stuff oh, really? like that and saying like without context, a lot of these behaviors are completely ambiguous and fighting and playing was a classic one with chimps. I think that was Bateson. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. The one that, the one that I liked was, um, he crafted, uh, Sorry for the terrible jargon word, schismogenesis. Fuck yeah, you did. Which is where two groups of people uh, decide to be less and less like each other. Like for no reason except for, you know, so one group will be like, um, we're the hat-wearing people, we love hats, and the yep. other and the other group of people are going, well, fucking hats are the worst. Monsters. And they just, yeah. just separate like that. Um, so, with chimps. And humans. Dolphins. <laughs> no doubt. There were three dolphins, remembers Lovett, Peter, Pamela, and Sissy, as I said. Yeah. Keith Sissy ne- was the biggest. Keith Nevin Jeanette. Pushy, loud. She sort of ran the show. Uh, pa- Pamela was very shy and fearful. And right. Peter was a young guy. He was coming of age. Uh-oh. And a bit naughty. Uh-huh. Margaret had a realisation. Even at this state-of-the-art dolphin house, barriers to communication remained. Every night, we'd all get in our cars and pull the garage door down and drive away. And I thought, well, there's this big brain floating around there all night. It amazed me that everybody kept leaving and I just thought it was wrong. Uh So Margaret reasoned Mm. that if she could live with the dolphin Mm -hmm. around the clock, nurturing its interest in making more human-like sounds, like a a mother teaching a child, Mm. um, then they'd have more success in this. I have no concerns about where this is going at all. Maybe it was because I was living so close to the lab. It just seemed so simple. Why let the water get in the way? So I said to John, I want to plaster everything and fill this place with water. I want to live here. So instead of having the- Well, not drag them onto the ground. No. no, (laughs) This water's inconvenient for me. So- Put wheels under the dolphin. It used to be the dolphins on the bottom floor and the lab up top. Yeah. Um, And she said, no, let's waterproof the upper floors of the lab, um, or at least the second floor and there's another one above it. The upper floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or the next one. And yes. Because that's that's it. What what do you want to make waterproof and fill with water? Top floor? (laughs) Done. (laughs) I see what you're saying. I like the engineering as well. Like, I, I Fuck yeah. no, no scientific experience. Did she have any engineering experience? No, but we liked her confidence. <laughs> and I mean, water. They not, said yes. Water's not that heavy. So, well, they they waterproofed the upper floors and flooded it to I think like a few feet deep, like enough that you, yeah. you it's like three feet deep. Weightable. Yeah, weightable sort of water. Yeah, and this would allow a dolphin to live uh, comfortably in the building with her for three months. Comfortably is doing a lot of heavy lifting, but I see what they're saying. So at this point, Margaret is in the water the whole time. Uh, That's so, not good for you. So there's a little desk that she's got set up that's sort of out of the water. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think there's a crawl space like where she can crawl up and onto a mattress that's out of the water. But she's basically in this pool of water. It's not, she's not 24-7, but she, no. is, she is close to. 23-5. She selected uh, Peter for her, she did. for her live-in experiment. I chose to work with Peter because he had uh, not had any human-like sound training and, and the other two had. So she wanted to start fresh. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, clean, sl- clean slate, Pete. 
She would attempt to live in isolation with him six days a week, sleeping on a makeshift uh, bed on the elevator platform in the middle of the room and doing her paperwork on a desk suspended from the ceiling and hanging over the water. On the seventh day, Peter would return to the sea pool downstairs to spend some time with the other dolphins. Good call. Play, play poker with his mates. By the summer of 1965, Margaret's domestic dolphin situation was ready to go. Lying in bed, surrounded by water that first night and listening to the pumps gurgling away, she remembers questioning what she was doing. Human people are out there having dinner or whatever, and here I am. There's moonlight reflecting on the water, this fin and this bright eye looking at you, and I thought, wow, why am I here? But then you get back into it, and it never occurred to me not to do it. What I was doing there was to find out what Peter was doing there and what we could do together. That was the whole point. Nobody had done that. Mm -hmm. So she continued. For the next six weeks, the next, uh, I think, three months eventually, Oh wow. um, they got paid visits by famous people, Carl Sagan. Yeah. Um, and uh, came down to um, p- to pay a visit and see what was going on. He was, that would have been my first guess. He was still an astronomer. I'll come back to him in a bit. Yeah. Audio recordings of Lovett's progress, meticulously yeah. archived on those uh, tapes. Now, this is the, the euphemistic description. Capture the energy that Lovett brought to the experiment. So those are the ones I've been playing throughout. Um, uh-huh. mm-hmm. Some people say that... Uh, well, she says M was particularly difficult. Margaret was difficult. Uh, but Peter might have more success with some other things. Uh, okay. <laughs> like cooking. I don't, no, like other words, like hello or ball. Um, oh, or help. <laughs> meanwhile, upstairs, uh, John Lilly was conducting his own experiments. Good. So while Margaret was teaching the dolphin English underneath, he got a, an isolation tank installed. And he was um, concerned because he hadn't, he'd, he hadn't had one for domestic use before. Right. His only other ones were in scientific facilities. And so he used some of the dolphin house budget to get himself a float tank. Okay. And he's floating up above the dolphins, seeing if he can listen into their communication. With his uh, mind? With his mind. With cool. His mind. We've all done that. Well, he believed that because dolphins, um, you know, communicate through sonar and things like that, he's feeling that they might be able to go through walls or anything like that and hear him in, in the float tank. And would be motivated to. But it's also when he decided to level up his, um, his float tank. Goody, and, goody, goody, goody. Um, and he added, added in the LSD at this point. Fuck yes. He got some LSD under a proposal um, <laughs> to see its effects on dolphins. So the pros is, you, you got any LSD? Yeah, I got money. No, no, this is when it's only, only for some Oh, he's getting the use. dolphins high? Yeah, first. Oh, that's cool. Well, he did, he did write in his autobiography... He wasn't super interested in getting the dolphins high. He wanted to talk to the dolphins, but he was like, I want it for my own use, but I need the only way I can get it is getting it for the dolphins. So, Oh, that's fair. So he's bullshitting. I get that, you know, like under false pretenses. That makes sense to me. So he, um, he gave the dolphins some LSD. But that, that I feel less um, attracted to. Didn't really do anything. Oh, really? Yeah. As far as he knows. It, it, nothing seemed to, seemed to happen. It seemed like they might have been a bit more playful or something like that, but no super meltdown. Okay. But then he got it, he took it himself and got into the tank. And yes. And this is where, you know, he, he goes full on. Yes. He goes full yes. on. Yes. Uh, his body disappeared. His consciousness, uh, conscious awareness of, his, of the bodily processes, of the existence of his body, yeah. all of it disappeared. Yeah. The knowledge of the self was all that was left. I am a small point of consciousness in a vast domain beyond my understanding. Yes. Vast forces of evolution of the stars are whipping me through coloured streamers of light, becoming matter, matter becoming light. The atoms are forming from light. Light is forming from the atoms. A vast consciousness directs these huge transitions. This is a Pink Floyd song. It totally is. With difficulty, I maintain my identity, myself. The surrounding processes interpenetrate my being and threaten to disrupt my own integrity, my cont- continuity in time. There is no time. No. This is an eternal place with eternal processes generated by beings far greater than I. I am becoming merely a small thought in that vast mind that is practically unaware of my existence. I am a small program in the huge cosmic computer. I really, really, really would like to do LSD and get one of those things. <laughs> like I really would. Do you know, do you know, it's, it's, it's almost like it's, it's the super most cliched version of LSD ever. Yeah. Like, like yeah. getting a scientist and, and in an isolation tank, get uh, the LSD, and it's like, I am, I am a dot in the cosmos. I'm like, one with the universe, and the universe is within me. Like, who, who, ha, ha, come on. <laughs> Would you not want to do that? Oh, no, that, that sounds freaking awesome. Like, I'll do it now. Freaking You've got awesome. a tank? Like, that would be just perfect. If you, you're going to have like a, a Beatles cartoon movie. You know, they used to do those trippy movies. Yep. That, 
You'd have that life. So down, so down for that. I think, I think it'd be great. John lay in the tank, remembering his experience in the vast universe, in the multi-dimensions uh, beyond his understanding. Uh, his discipline as a scientist slowly but surely reasserted itself. He well, climbed, climbed out of the tank, yep. took a shower, and wrote his notes. He realized somehow that they were incomplete. There were instructions he could barely remember, which sounded somewhat as follows. <laughs> this agent is not to remember all of this experience. It will be stored below his levels of awareness in his biocomputer. At the appropriate times in the future, he will remember more and more of this experience when he can integrate it without demolishing his role in the human consensus reality of the planet Earth. Well, that is a danger. <sighs> One does not want to demolish that role. <laughs> in the end, um, I think Lily's dolphin research, the whole dolphin house, the whole dolphin program was built on a contradiction um, that just couldn't hold. Yeah. Um, Science and really, really, really being high. Yes, and there's another one. There's another one. As he wrote in his own No theory, no biology, no. No, no, th th there's some. <laughs> okay. The dolphin work progressed to a certain critical point beyond which he felt he should not go at that time. Yeah. His own appreciation of the dolphins as intelligent, sentient animal alien beings who wish to communicate with man led to his acceptance of new strictures on dolphin research. Basically, he started to believe he believed it all. He believed that the dolphins were trying to communicate Sure. And the dolphins had minds and the dolphins were deserving of communication. Okay. And um, he, in fact, started to advocate at, around this time that dolphins should have a seat on the United Nations. Or, or a tank on the United Nations. Citation, a tank on the United Nations, yeah. Um, yeah, because then you could say, what's your opinion? And they'd go, what, what, <laughs> what? But 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 here's the thing. He's starting to believe. He's he's believing deep down that dolphins are um, a worthy or perhaps more intelligent than us. Yes, and uh, we shouldn't be doing research on them. So whilst whilst he's living close to them okay. and and seeing this, he got got harder and harder. Same time, um, a former employee of the institute sued them. I don't know what for. They lost a whole bunch of money. They were forced to sell. Oh, and um, and all of all of his friends that were funding it, and I don't know which one this is at NASA. Or the um, or the army um, stopped funding the research and uh, huh. donated. So um, support for the dolphin research was was withdrawn, and Lily decided to close the lab. I think oh. it was only running for a few years. As the funding dried up, Margaret was put in charge of decommissioning the dolphin house. The dolphins were shipped to a disused bank building in Miami. Why? With little or no sunlight, smaller tanks, and not much human contact, things deteriorated pretty quickly. What's the reasoning? You don't know. Why? Why there? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know why Flipper Studios wouldn't take them back. Or the ocean. Anyway, I'm uh, old fashioned. No, no, they're they're human talking dolphins. That would that would. Oh, what a waste! That would corrupt. They, but, and who's going to take that UN seat? Well, exactly. I mean, if we if oh, we let man. the ones that can speak English back in, they'll teach all the others English, and that that. And then they'll listen in. Yeah, that's. They'll that's know what we're saying in our submarines. Apparently, um, a few weeks after Margaret. Uh, after the dolphins had gone to that bank building, um, Margaret received a call from John Lilly telling her that Peter had suicided. As I said before, this, uh, dolphin biologists say this is this is legit. Mm. Uh, breathe, their breathing is conscious, and Peter chose not to breathe, and they found him dead at the bottom of the tank. Wow. Margaret said she wasn't terribly unhappy about it. I was more unhappy about him being in those conditions at the Miami lab than not being at all. Nobody was going to hurt Peter. He wasn't, he wasn't going to hurt. He wasn't going to be unhappy. He was just gone. And that was okay. Odd, but that's how it was. All right. Margaret stayed on the island marrying the uh, photographer who'd captured pictures of the experiment. I you say marrying the first person she met. <laughs> marrying the uh, they moved back into the dolphin house and eventually renovating it into a family house with a uh, home where they brought up three daughters. With a swimming pool on the seal, on the <laughs> roof, just yeah. because that's where you put it. Uh, on a Caribbean bungalow. It's fallen into disrepair now, uh, but a lot of people locally still remember it and talk about the, the dolphin house, um, and people talk about the stories there. Uh. Lily quest continued on his quest to understand the mind. He left mainstream science a long way behind. Well, then. He continued to advocate for dolphins, for cetaceans, to have a seat on the United Nations. It, cetaceans on the nations. I mean, I get it that it rhymes, but beyond that. But if, they're, but if you believe they're this smart. Sure. But if you can't actually have some kind of a reasonable exchange of ideas. Well, well John thought they could. But John thought they could. But he showed no evidence. <laughs> the interesting thing for me is how much um, people loved this shit at the time. 
Of course. Like one of the one of the biggest ones was, I mean, you, you can see isolation tank stuff pops up in Stranger Things. Mm. Um, talking dolphins in Sequest DSV. Uh, Mission to Save the Whales in Star Trek IV. Yeah. Um, there was a, a Sega Mega Drive Genesis game called Echo the Dolphin, which was based on okay. uh, some of John's far out theories. But but my favorite my favorite one is the Order of the Dolphin. Uh, this so, is a movie. No, it's not a movie. So, but no, this, if you're going to talk movies, the the one that this makes me think of immediately is Altered States. Which yes, is, yeah. You're that, gonna, you're that, gonna, no, I'm not going to get into it. That, that, I, saw, I saw that come up, but I haven't seen it. It's uh, oh, it's it's. It's exactly the whole trying to find the origin of humanity, and you, this guy like William Hurt de evolves as he goes into the isolation tank, and he gets to the point where you know, he periodically turns into this <laughs> kind of crazy ape-like creature as he does stronger doses of ketamine or something. And it's it was a big splash in the late seventies. I saw stuff. I really haven't 80s. seen it, but I, I did see stuff talking about that. Oh, that it's it's on, all it's all it's about very much, shit, like all about. There's nothing to do with dolphins, but yeah. other than that. Well, this is the interesting thing that um, you could carve off bits of John Lilly's career and go, okay, just look at mm, that bit, mm. or just look at that bit. Yep. Uh, but it, but it clearly weaves together when he's on this quest to understand what is the mind. Yeah. Um, and all the way through. No, the Order of the Dolphin, uh, 1961. Uh, so Sputnik wasn't so far off, but I think it was early on where a bunch of astronomers decided uh, to start thinking about alien contact. So cool. what would we do if there was alien contact? How do we do start a search for extraterrestrial Horror. life? Yeah. And so there was a, a famous meeting where some of the luminaries in search for extraterrestrial life, like Frank Drake, Carl Sagan, met at a farm. Not su- super secret. There was like 10 of them. Yeah. And um, – just to sort of plan the research and think it all out. Yeah. And um, John Lilly came along as well. And <laughs> the, the other one's like, why is he here? Well, no. Really well, cool. at first, at first, it was it was a collection of different sorts of people. At first, there might have been a bit of why is he here? But pretty quickly they were like, fuck, this guy is the guru. Like they listened oh, really? to him. They listened to him and they were, and he he was talking about uh. the intelligence of dolphins. And, you know, he was saying it's great to contact extraterrestrials. Mm. Awesome. But let's learn about the other mind that we have here on the planet uh, that what? is worth understanding. And so sure. they, they, I think it was a weekend long conference. They, they loved everything he was saying. And so they decided that search for extraterrestrial life, the, the group that they were, was the order of the dolphin in, in his honor. That they yes, thought it was. This is, this is the first contact for non-human life is dolphins. And so the modern version of that is octopus. Pooses. Mm. Look, I came to this story um, originally not through that bit that I don't really want to talk about, but I can if you want. Um, but really, I came to this with this idea of how have people tried to talk to animals and where are we up to in that? And, you know, there, there's there's a whole bunch of projects now that are using a lot of AI sort of things yeah. to, to try to understand what animal, animals are saying. We seem to be having some movement in that direction. Sure. But uh, I think it's John's John Lilly's project that sort of starts this whole. So he was pre Coco the sign languaging gorilla. Yes, yes. Uh, pre Alex the parrot. Um, Alex the parrot. There's a couple of couple of sign languaging gorilla, gorillas as well. Um, did, did Alex the parrot use sign language with his little claws? No, he spoke. He knew he knew words. Alex the parrot. Yeah, who's is, a, who's is, a pretty boy is not great for the. Well, Alex the parrot is the only non-human animal to ask a question. But do, you, do you have any food? Uh, uh, no, I think it was d- deeper than that. Something, something a more a richer question. I wonder because I mean we were, we were in developmental psych a thousand years ago when I was doing the eighties, showing the sign language in chimp was all the rage, yeah, uh, yeah, gorilla yeah. was all the rage, and the amount of controversy, you know, the, the, the anger it instilled in some people that this is impossible and bullshit, and they got no sense of self, and then other people go, "You got to be kidding me! Look at this! Look at that!" Virtually at that. talks about God. Oh, look, this gets this people is, incensed. This is the thing that. I don't doubt there is absolutely legitimate science to be to be done in this area. Yeah. Uh, but I do think, you know, when you listen to some of the things that um, Margaret and Peter's response, there's a lot of willful belief here oh, to yeah. say, "Oh yeah, that's." Uh, Margaret. <laughs> no, wrong. Margaret. <laughs> Peter, that's noise. I think it was all noise. Peter, that's was, noise. It was all noise. I don't think there was ever a moment where they ever got something. Now maybe they believe they did. That was actually some clear communication. But uh, why would you even think 
They would. They're not liar birds. They're not fucking cockatoos. Like they don't mimic human speech sounds in any way that I'm aware. So let's try and yell at them until they do. Like it does. <laughs> That alone, forget the science part, they don't seem, well, kind of science, they don't have the vocal tract, the the shapes to make human speech sounds. <laughs> it's close. It's close. Yeah, because they, they, they have a tiny bit. They have tongues and noses. Anyway, I want to talk to dolphins. I think it'd be great fun. Oh, I got no beef with it. I just, but you're right, the willful hopefulness, you know, where you, you listen to it and you're going, I think we made progress. I think so. that one was hello. Have you? I, I, yeah. Have I you? think it was. And it's, it's one dolphin, one person. It's like, oh. And the training method is really good. No, that's wrong. <laughs> you don't speak English. What if I yell no, that's wrong at you often? <laughs> <laughs>